started with a legend in R.A. Salvatore as he discussed the companions and the return of Drist and the companions to the Forgotten Realms. Now we can just talk book six with Ed Greenwood, the founder of the Forgotten Realms, with the Herald. Throughout this series, I hope you guys have enjoyed our interviews with Paulus Kemp, Aaron M. Evans, Richard Lee Byers, and Troy Denning. But right now, folks, we're sitting down with the legend himself, the man who discovered, who founded, the Forgotten Realms, Ed Greenwood. I hope you enjoy episode 152 of Bombay Radio. So we have with us Ed Greenwood, who has written the sixth and final book of the Sundering series, and is probably most famous for founding the Forgotten Realms that the Sundering is in in the first place. So I guess we're gonna the first question we're going to ask you is, you, you created the realms, at least Wikipedia says, in 67, and then it got sold you know, way later when it actually became more of a thing. Um, do you ever think that the realms would still exist this many years later from when it started? Hmm, yes and no, <laughs> he said, clear as a bell. Okay, I, I actually started it in 1966, but it wasn't really called The Realms until 1967. I was a little kid, so I was writing a world to set my own fantasy short stories in. There, there were no role-playing games beyond Kriegspiel, you know, the, the sort of general staff style um, military war games where... You, you have one group of players in one room and one in another, and an umpire runs between them, and you do the fog of war thing. That is far, That was as far as role-playing games went then. You know, D&D hadn't come along. Um, I am surprised that they took off, the realms took off to the extent that it did, and has lasted as a product line this long, yes. Um I had I had originally arranged things in, in my um, dealings with, with the original TSR so that I would get the realms back if they ever stopped publishing it. And I did that because having watched the world of gaming, I was acutely aware that games came along and when they stopped selling, they were dropped like hot potatoes and the, the company that produced that game uh, would go on to other things. And I thought, well, that, that's great, but I don't want the realms to then be stuck in limbo. You know, I can't use it. Nobody can use it. So I, I had sort of arranged things that it would survive one way or the other. But in the back of my mind, it was I was always thinking, well, you know, after this is all over and the shouting dies down and, and the, the crowd runs on to the next bright, shiny thing, at least we'll have some beautiful colored maps and so on. And there'll be a few people who love the realms scattered all over the world. And, and hey, I can... I can be pen pals with them or run into them at conventions. In the meantime, I'll, I'll be playing in my world the way I've always been playing in my world with my player, my, my, my sort of home campaign players. Because from about 1978, I was playing regularly the D and D. I had recast everything in the realms to, to fit the rules of Dungeons and Dragons as they then were. So I thought it would last forever, but I didn't, necessarily think it would last forever as a product line, as a published world. And I'm, you know, surprised and gratified and honored by the way it has grown and the number of people I've met all over the world and the number of intensely talented creative people who've sort of jumped into the realms and, and written novels and short stories and designed games and, and done costumes and gotten involved and everything, and it's just great. So this really, really fascinates me because um, as a kid, I I still do today, but as, as a kid I wrote in fantasy message boards for role-playing and so on, and then my dream was to turn those stories that we told into a movie, and I actually wrote a movie script for it, actually two of them, um, and nowadays I want to actually turn it into a book because movie scripts are hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I, I'm... I'm, I, I'm you know, nitpicking it, but so you actually was able were able to turn your childhood fantasy stories or your your I, your world that you were creating as a kid into a full full universe. How how did this happen? Like how how in the world did you get to turn those ideas into something far bigger? Hmm. Well, there there are two answers to that, and the first answer is at the beginning I was writing a fantasy setting just to please me, 
I was writing generally dreadful little short fantasy short stories, um, pastiches of everybody who caught my eye that I read books of in my father's den. And one of those authors was Fritz Leiber, who did A Fawford and Grey Mouser. And I noticed that although each story was a pretty much a self-contained tale, they all took place in the same world. So if you happen to pick up the right issues of the magazines that they were published in initially, and you sort of put them all together, and later Lynn Carter came along and started publishing the Ballantine Adult Fantasy series, and we got to see some of these things in, anso in anthologies and so on, you were learning a little bit more about the world with each one, and you joined them together. So I started doing the same thing. So no pressure whatsoever on myself. I was growing the world one episode at a time. And in those days, my main character was a, a sort of knockoff of Shakespeare's Falstaff, a fat, wheezing a guy called Mert the Moneylender, who had been a sort of a mercenary war captain in his youth and had been a, an adventurer almost in the Conan mold, although his friend Dernan was really the thinking man's Conan. And Mert was a um, now a fat, wheezing old man who could no longer outfight enemies or outrun them, so he had to outwit them. And what this generally meant, because he wasn't too good at it, was that he left town at the end of each short story, each episode in his life, uh, one step ahead of his creditors or his rivals or the authorities or all three. And because of that, he was traveling along a coast from port city to port city. And that became the Sword Coast, and the realms grew that way. So I wasn't even thinking about it. It was just organically growing. And later on, when I started playing Dungeons & Dragons in the realms, it received a big boost from my players because my players were superb actors, the consummate role players. And so they were always sort of looking across the table to me as the dungeon master and saying, okay, what is this guy wearing? Um, okay, this caravan, where did it come from? What's inside the wagons? Can, can we see? And of course, obviously, if it's coming from place X and the wagons are full of fill in the blank, there's a surplus of the fill in the blank back at place X, and there's a need for it or shortage at place Y where the caravan is going to. So you you build the world without really thinking about it in response to what your players need in play, because you two as Dungeon Master are trying to make this as realistic as possible. You're, you're putting on all the funny voices, playing all the characters, and you're trying to treat the place as it's real. I don't mean that you're nuts and think this imaginary world you're creating is real. I mean, you treat it as if it's real. You give it the respect and level of detail as if everything's real. Everything has to be worked out. If people go to the bathroom, it has to flow somewhere. If people need to take a drink, they have to get whatever they're drinking from somewhere. The, the circle of life is built in everywhere. And because of that, the realms grew organically long before there was a need to show it to the wider world in a published form. So it was actually pretty easy to detail it. it it's just that I've never stopped. And we're, we're almost, yeah, we're, we're getting up towards 50 years of the realms. You know, we're, it's been going for a while. So I have been detailing and detailing and madly detailing for years. And it's just piled up. <laughs> When it comes to detailing the realms, you know, there's been lots of writers and game creators that have added, you know, created stuff. You know, there's Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale, Neverwinter Nights game series. You have tons of books. You have, you know, what Wizards have been doing, Wizards of the Coast has been doing with, you know, uh, D&D. &D. Uh, how much of the detail of the realms comes from you, or at least uh, the way the different, I should say, uh, eras of the realms go? How much of that comes from you, and how, how much of it comes from Wizards of the Coast? Oh, okay. Well, at the, in the beginning... Ooh, that sounds very biblical. Uh, okay. Um, the things you cited, like Baldur's Gate, that name is mine, the city is mine. Neverwinter, that name is mine, the city is mine. Um, there was actually a Neverwinter Nights long before there were any computer games, because Neverwinter Nights was the name of a jokey little newspaper that um, existed in the realms, as in we had the, the Waterdeep Trumpet, the Neverwinter Nights was a, a weekly tabloid, a broadsheets um, published in the city of Neverwinter. And um, Jeff Grubb of TSR said, okay, we've got a computer licensee interested in this. Um, is it okay if we borrow your name, Neverwinter Nights? And I said, sure. And away it went. And, and things like that happened a lot. So 
in the beginning, uh, because the realms wasn't fully revealed to even to TSR, the best way to proceed was to pick up the phone, there was no internet then, and call Ed. So <laughs> I would get these constant phone calls, hey, um, we're thinking of doing bendable hand puppets. Um, give us some names and likenesses. Uh, somebody wants to do a coloring book or, or a computer game um, set. Um, have you got anything that sort of, you know, is, is Robin Hoodish or jungleish or Arabian Nights-ish or whatever? And I would say, well, over here or over there. So I was sort of the guy who knew where all the skeletons were buried in all the closets. And so from me came the suggestions. Now, that doesn't mean I had a veto power or final say. And increasingly, as time has gone on, um, things like the Baldur's Gate series and so on have taken on a life of their own so that the licensee, the, the company that's producing them, is fully competent to do their own thing. And the copyright holder, which is now Wizards of the Coast, having inherited it from TSR, takes on the role of trying to make sure that there's a consistent look and feel for things uh, from uh, a television show to a uh, movie script to a, a novel to a a coloring book, uh, anything that, that, you know, the king of a place would look the same and have the same name at the same time in all of, across all those platforms. So increasingly that means, uh, although, you know, if you're wise, you still, you know, call up Ed because Ed might say, ah, but wait a minute, blah, 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 you know, and, and tell you of a possible complication. I increasingly, the the people who are creatively at work in the realms they're they don't need me uh they're they're fully fledged creatives just as conversant and expert in areas of the realms as i've ever been so and there are people i defer to you know in in certain when we're talking about certain topics or regions of the realms i go hey this person knows more than me you know because the one thing i've discovered is my brain isn't large enough to hold and remember everything i can remember my stuff, my creations and stuff I've been directly involved in, either through play or through design or through writing fiction, but not everything that other people have written and created has managed to stick in my brain. Even though, you know, I've read all the novels and I reread some of them from time to time whenever I need to refresh myself, it doesn't all stick because my brain is that huge crammed warehouse you saw at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know. <laughs> so I can't keep everything straight. So increasingly, it is a shared world, which is, of course, what it was intended to be when I when I made the decision to say, yes, please publish my world. And, you know, and at the time, T TSR said, you realize, you know, you're losing control of your baby. It's our baby now. It's all of our babies. You know, well, we share this thing. And I said, that's cool, because, of course, I had an advantage. I'm an OK cartographer, but I can't do beautiful maps the way somebody who can print with inks as opposed to use pencil crayon, which is what I had to get to, to produce color. Um, and I can't, I, I become a bottleneck. I can't possibly pump out stories fast enough to please everybody in every corner of the realms. And the other thing is my world can't su surprise me ever. If I'm the only creator, there's only something around the corner because I put it there. It's a blank page until I set pen to it or, you know, these days, fingers to the keyboard. But the way the way it's evolved as a shared world, it can my own world, my own creation can surprise me. Now, the the it works best for me when things are closely built off of my original concepts. So when I think of a particular power group or a particular country or or a particular location in that country, I'm mentally picturing it the same way that the people who are working on it do. For instance, I just worked uh, um, Turbine on the Haunted Halls of Evening Star as a computer game, and it was delightful to see how they had sort of embraced my original dungeon, said, okay, here's what we have to do for our needs as a computer game. And so we were making these changes and these developments, these logical developments, and they were logical developments. So I said, oh, this is great. It's all, almost as though the dungeon came alive and things changed behind my back over, you know, 20, 30 years. And now it's like, wow, this is cool. This is what would have happened. I'm just trying to wrap my head around. You've read every single Realms novel. Uh, all the ones that have been published and a few of them that haven't been published yet. 
That's a lot of novels. <laughs> I have 80,000 books in this house. I have read almost all of them. And some of them I've read many, many times. <laughs> your, your, your other job is a librarian, right? Or a library clerk, isn't it? Yes, I, I'm, I'm currently a reference clerk at the Fort Hope Public Library. And I'm on the library board of the Crammy Township Public Library. Yes, I, I read lots of books. I work with books every day. And I try and connect readers with books or or citizens with information. Because increasingly, there's stuff on the Internet that isn't in book form that they need to get to, you know. That, 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 that's, that, that amazes me. So uh, just a little get back on topic, I guess. Uh, we've interviewed every single author of the Sundering series. And I've interviewed quite a few other authors who have also written in the realms. And all of them agree that they, they say the two de facto leaders of the realms would be you and, and Bob Salvatore. Would you, would you agree as far as that goes? It definitely in terms of fiction, yes. It, it's, it's, it's a little more difficult to defend that position if you're strictly speaking from the point of view of uh, game design, for instance. Because... Bob is less active in game design, and I am less active than, than I used to be, you know, at times in game design. But yes, if you're thinking of fiction and the characters and the concepts of the realms, a Bob has definitely captured the widest audience and brought the most newcomers who are not gamers, but, and, but are fantasy fans, into contact with the realms. And yeah, I would say that that was why when the sundering was, was sort of thought up, um, that they decided, okay, Bob will lead off and Ed will back clean up at the end. So whose idea was the center? Cause, cause Bob mentioned, and I actually think Kemp mentioned as well, that the idea was between you and, and Bob that, uh, is to revitalize the realms, um, to, to shift it from what we've had with D and D four, um, with the spell plague and so on, to a new era bringing back a lot of elements that now this is book six, and so it's not really a spoiler to mention that gods are coming back and the spell plague is changing. <laughs> um, so uh, was it your idea? Was it his idea? Was it a combination? Or did um, wizards approach you to and say, we need to do something? And how, how did this whole thing develop to what it is now? Ooh, it was a long process. Um, the, the thing that we were all agreed on because remember, um, both Bob and I were involved in the lead up to fourth edition, and there was a, a summit at Gen Con, and we were both thinking, uh oh, I, I don't like the sounds of this. Because um, at, at that moment, th that moment in time, the most important thing for us was a time jump. You know, we, we were jumping ahead 100 years, and we were at pains to point out to the, the powers that be at Wizards at that time that a time jump may be a jumping on point for a new audience, but it's also a convenient jumping off point for an old audience. In the same way that if you've collect, collected a comic book for years and they decide to reboot the comic book, change the origin of the character, you may love that or you may go, you know, I collected this character for 20 years. It meant something to me. You just tossed it aside and changed everything. Right. I'm out of here. I don't, you know, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't like this new one. The old one was for me, and you guys have just swept it away. And and th that danger was there. So at that time, you know, Bob pointed out, you know, you could be going on the wrong path here. But the sundering as you see it now is because people at Wizards of the Coast wanted to move on from what we saw in the fourth edition realms. But it wasn't like, oh, throw away the the, the fourth edition realms, it was the realms we treat it as if it's real. So things have to change and happen within the world. You don't just change things without explanation. Oh, you know all that stuff we said in fourth edition? It's now different. You don't do that. You, you have been doing for decades of l literal real time unfolding a history of an imaginary place, and you just go on doing that. You say, okay, and then this happens and things change. And rather than have things happen in a very slow, weird drift, what you have instead is something large and dramatic, a, as I, as I said at the time, a realm-shaking event to hopefully end all realm-shaking events, but you have a chance to tell a huge saga. And that's what we did. We, we told a big story, you know, with six novels. It was a chance to 
uh, tell how the move uh, the the realms moved on from what we saw in the spell plague to what happened next, and to do it in in the form of a hopefully stirring uh, series of novels, rather than just saying, "Oh, everything changed." You know, when you woke up, everything was changed. No, no, that 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 not only doesn't treat the world with the respect I think it deserves, it misses a chance to tell a fascinating story. Now, why would you pass up a chance to tell a fascinating story? It would be like doing a, a huge movie that was centered around a war and then saying, you know, let's not show you any of the war. Let's just show you the peace negotiations at the end. And 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 then they will, they'll argue about what will happen next and how we'll restore the economy. And you go, hey, wait a minute. Where's all the exciting stuff? Well, this was a chance to show the exciting stuff. I was one of the ones that, when they switched to fourth, that kind of jumped off for a bit. Because, uh, I, 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 I don't know, maybe I got bored, maybe I got old, I don't know. But this is this series has definitely brought me back. It, every single book he's been building on the one before and has definitely gotten me interested in not just the realms again, but a lot of characters I used to know, and as far as you know, Bob and stuff goes, and a lot of characters I never, I never read, like uh, Kemp's novels or Denning returning after what twelve years, fourteen years. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, a lot of these characters I've never seen before. And so, do you feel the Realms is in a better place now, perhaps at least creatively, than it was with Fourth Edition, or do you feel it's just j- just uh, just a new direction, and it's it was time to move on now, and it's it's just it just works that way. I I. I think there was a there there was a problem with fourth edition that needed to be addressed, and the problem was that because Wizards of the Coast was publishing two books for each game setting, that was the plan anyway. You know, so we got a a, a campaign guide for the Forgotten Realms, and then a player's guide for the Forgotten Realms, and then moved on to um, Eberron and Dark Sun to do a, a a player's guide and a campaign guide. What that meant was anything that wasn't in those books, if you were a gamer who already had an ongoing campaign in the world, or if you were a reader of realms fiction who wanted to know more about whatever was your favorite thing, you know, a a place or a person or whatever, if it wasn't in those two books, you were sort of left hanging. And it was like, well, well, uh, what happened? Uh, uh, wow. you know, and although the the possibility exists of using the Wizards of the Coast website um, as a chance as a vehicle for for you know getting the lore you needed, because maybe somebody would write a short story, or maybe somebody would write a, a game column. The, there was this feeling like, well, I want to know more about this, and I want to know more about that. And the other thing that that I think is really cool is what Wizards of the Coast is doing now in-house. First, when they were, were working on D&D Next, and there was this concerted project that John Shindahedi, who was the, the, then the art director, was doing, was making sure that iconic um, monsters, for instance, like the Owl Bear, like the Beholder, like dragons, l- would look the same from product to product. So you know, if there was a, a computer game adaptation, or if there was a cover for a novel and you had an owlbear on both of them, they would look the same. You know, so the, 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 there was this cool uh, um, way of making sure that, that the world had a consistent look. And, and, of course, in the case of the Forgotten Realms, people who live in a particular area, what do they wear? What's the, what's the sort of regional costume? What's the regional architecture? That was really cool. The other thing that I think has really inspired me is uh, seeing how there is a um, a master of story, um, I, I'm I don't know what the precise formal title is right now, but somebody in charge of the storyline for the realms going forth, and the tyranny of dragons that was just announced last week is the next story after the Sundering, and I know because I you know working behind the scenes as a consultant, but I can't talk about the details, that there are other stories beyond the Tyranny of Dragons. There, are, there is an ongoing plan so that the realms will move into the future. There will always be cool stuff happening, and it's not just going to be at random. It's not going to be um, a person writing a novel working in a vacuum. Just, okay, what would I like to have happen next? You know, sort of thing. 
because although you can do that and it works perfectly for your characters, and I mean anybody who's followed Bob Salvatore's Drizzt novels, you can see this organic growth and development for of his characters as they adventure in the realms. That works perfectly, but for a gaming point of view, you also want to have um, large stories that can be adapted in, as computer games that also have a geographical impact because it allows you to detail new areas. For instance, uh, last year we did Murder in Baldur's Gate, so we got to see an updating of the city of Baldur's Gate. And and that's the sort of thing that really excites me, the, 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 what's going forward. So being that you were able to, you know, back clean up, as you say, uh, right, the last book in the Sundering series, uh, how much influence did you take on from the previous five novels? Did you, because I know these books are connected in world events, but not really like, they, they cross over a little bit, but uh, how much did, how much influence did you get from the previous five novels? Did you read them before you wrote yours or did you just know where you wanted to go from the beginning? Well, we had these super secret summit meetings where we all got together, if we could, um, around um, conference tables at Wizards of the Coast. And if we couldn't, we, we, we phoned in, you know, and were voices out of the ceiling. And we, we, we hammered all this out in general terms, what was going to happen in the sundry. So we all knew the general thing. And, and I, I have to fess up here, although it was said often that I would back clean up, the thing is I couldn't really back clean up in every detail. I couldn't go through the previous five novels and tie off all the loose ends for the very good reason that I got to read Bob's novel cover to cover, although there were no covers, it wasn't published yet before I wrote mine. I was able to read Paul Kemp's novel, um, rough draft and then final draft, cover, uh, cover to cover again, wasn't published yet. And I knew what Aaron was doing in the adversary because she and I were emailing back and forth extensively about stuff. But I hadn't seen any of Richard Lee Byer's writing or Troy's writing, the actual writing. We'd, we'd sat in hotel lobbies and talked about these things, and we'd sat around the conference table and talked about these things. But I hadn't actually seen one word, although I'd heard brief little bits at the previous year's Gen Con and, and in Columbus just before that when, when we talked about these things, of those, two, of those last two novels. So I couldn't... Uh, tie up any loose ends from those two novels because I didn't know the, the exact prose details of everything that was in them. The other thing is, well, as you've probably you know gathered by reading the Sundering novels so far, the accent here was to tell good, coherent, standalone stories. Although there can be characters that that move from one novel to another, so that they're in both of them, and you can have recurring consequences of all the big things that are happening in the sundering and of course in my novel they rush to the climax the inevitable earth shaking pulse pounding big battles climax happens in the herald because it's got to happen in the herald there's no more books on the sundering after the herald this is the this is the moment toe to toe this is where it's it, it's all decided at the same time i can't sort of wander through the realms because I don't have a word count to write the Herald that would make it fill a bookshelf as opposed to fit inside one set of covers to, to go through the realms and, and make sure everybody who is a realms fan is brought up to date on every last person and location across the world. Because for one thing, that would be terribly confusing and impenetrable to somebody who's coming to the realms for the first time because of the sundering. They're, they're, they're already going to be reading the Herald saying, who are all these people? What's going on? And that's okay because the fog of war, you're in the middle of everything and you don't know what's going on. You just keep, keep on fighting, trying to survive. And I wanted to convey that impression. So there, it's, it's no mistake that we jump all over the place and there are lots of people and they're usually running and shouting with weapons and you're, you're, you're sort of standing in the middle bewildered as one thing after another comes at you because that's what I wanted to convey. I wanted you to be there looking over the shoulders of characters as important things happen to them, which is, of course, exactly what you saw in all of the previous novels. You are there looking over the shoulder of um, the Tansel family in Godborn, um, Farida and her companions in The Adversary, um, 
on the on the inner sea, on the Sea of Fallen Stars, in the Reaver, there in Cormir, with Cleef, in the Sentinel, and of course, there as the companions um, come together again in, in, in Bob's initial novel. So, I mean, the important thing was to tell a good story that could stand alone, because if for any reason you can't buy and read and find all of the novels of the Sundering and read them in order, and you just pick up a middle novel, or for the sake of argument, my novel at the end, it should still be a good, entertaining read and tell its own story, even if you don't get the full nuances because you haven't read any of the previous ones, or you haven't met all these characters before. I mean, it is possible to read The Herald as just the next book that happens to Elminster after Elminster Enraged, which was the last book in the Sage of Shadowdale trilogy. And and in fact, if you haven't read that trilogy, you will be wondering who these two characters, Amaroon and Arklath, are. You know, as you read through the Herald, who are these people? Uh, it will become clear from context as the story unfolds, um, the role they play in the story. But there's an added impact if you're a longtime Realms fan and people show up for a few moments and you go, ah, so and so, great. You know, but but I don't want the the book to become a, a catalog of oh we have to revisit everybody oh we have to look in on everybody and to it, it's it's as if we were all on a bus in a strange city and the bus was screeching to a halt at a bus stop every hundred yards if you are a stranger to that city you're bewildered by all the places you're seeing and the the names of the stops that are being called out and all the people getting on and off the bus it, it's just overwhelming. But for somebody who has um, immersed themselves in the realms and enjoyed it for 20 or 30 years, they can go, ah, oh, I hear all these extra people. But at the same time, I want the bus ride to make sense for the person for whom that's their first realm story. So I can't really fully back clean up. What I can do is finish the tale of the sundering and say, okay, all this crazy stuff was going on across the world it comes down to this and you're there as this happens well one thing that uh that, that bob said and, and will help with troy and so on as well is that he he said he was he was tired of adrift he was getting ready to retire him and the companions was going to be his last one but he enjoyed writing that book so much that it revitalized him and now he's writing more books about <laughs> about Drist. and you know denny came back and now wants to write more books and forgotten realms and and so on um were you experiencing any Elminster fatigue or any of your character fatigue at this time and this revitalized you, or is it just you just continue full on full steam ahead from where you've started years and years ago? Well, there there's a, again, yes and no. Um I was in the middle of a multi book contract and they were all supposed to be Elminster novels. So <laughs> my work was, you know, clear before me, the task at hand. But in the world, in the Forgotten Realms I was exploring with Elminster in the Sage of Shadowdale trilogy in particular, although it's been building in books before that. Elminster is tired. He is beyond sick of watching everybody he loves, countries he loves, be destroyed and pass away, and he outlives them. The goddess he serves, the goddess he loved, Mistra, um, destroyed. He's soldiering on. And so when we when we first meet him in in the first book of the Sage of Shadowdale trilogy, Elminster must die. He's been reduced to a state in which, if he casts a spell, he goes insane, and therefore he needs someone to mentally support him. And that's and well, it, it's it's basically Storm Silverhand for most of the time in that book, and he wants desperately to die, to retire. He's done. He's drained, he's spent, he's sick of it all, but he's devoted his entire life to this cause of serving Mistra. And because that gave his life meaning, he cannot relinquish that work until he's got a successor who he thinks is competent to do the job and strong enough to survive once they're on their own. Because he fully realizes that anybody who is perceived as his successor, because he's made a lot of enemies over, you know, 
well over a thousand years, um, is has a target painted on them by virtue of being his successor. And throughout the Sage of Shatterdale trilogy, he finds a descendant of his, his great, 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 granddaughter, Amaroon. But he he can't he cannot bring himself to, in effect, write her death sentence by saying, OK, kid, here are the keys. You drive the car. I'm out of here because he realizes she would not last long because there are so many enemies waiting to get back at him. And if they can't get back at him, they'll take it out on her. So he feels it's it's his duty to train his successor to um, temper her in fire so she's strong enough. And we see that in that trilogy and then here in the Herald. So by the end of the Herald, you can see Elminster going from, I'm sick of all this, I want to die, to I've got the fire back. Yes, it all makes sense now. I'm good to go, second wind or 14th wind or 24th wind, I'm back. And so that's that you're seeing that throughout these these books. So I have been exploring what it is to um, be inspired to to come back to the table. But I've been exploring it in the world with the character. Uh, it has always been my in, uh, intention to, you know, stick around until I, I cease to, to be alive um, doing stuff for the realms one way or the other. I want to be involved with my creation. I know it's our creation now, it's shared, but I want to be around telling stories of the realms. And what it seems to me, and I've had the chance to try other things like the Knights of Mithranor trilogy, that um, people want to see more Elminster. So it really doesn't matter if I'm sick of Elminster or not sick of, El sick of Elminster. Writing stories about a shared world that lots of fans enjoy isn't about what I want. It's about what all of the fans of the realms want. And I realize that their wants and needs and desires are contradictory and we can't please everyone. But it, the realms is doomed if we ever stop listening to people and say, oh, you want to see that? Good, because that's what we set up. We wanted you to want to see that. But but oh, oh, we didn't think of that. Okay, we're going there. You want it? You got it. Because that's what this is. Uh, in the same way that um, a, a person writes a, a long-running series of mystery novels, although they are not beholden to an individual reader to have things turn out to be the way that that reader wanted them to, which is why some of the worst reviews that we see on the internet are people trashing books because the author didn't write the book that they wanted the author to write. I guess the author wasn't a good enough mind reader to, to figure out what they wanted. But I mean, it is that we, we have to write what people want and go where people want to go and explore what people want to see. If there's something that's popular, then we'll give you more of it. <laughs> it's a service industry. So you've, you've done the Sun Ring. We're now into D&D &D 5, which it definitely promises to be more um, magical, so to speak. So we're going to backtrack just a little bit because we have some fan, uh, fan questions here, and now is probably the best time to ask. First one is, uh, Elminster appears in games like Baldur's Gate. I think he was in Neverwinter Nights and Icewind Dale as well, but I'm not 100% sure. Did you ever play those games or know what happens in those games, and were you pleased with how uh, Bioware and uh, Obsidian and so on used the realms in a very award... Well, those games won a lot of awards in, a, in an award-winning way for video gamers? Well, okay. Again, in my eternal answer, yes and no. Uh, and, and the reason I say yes and no is... I have been working almost exclusively on Macintosh computers all these years for, because originally uh, TSR, um, my, my um, advance for, for the novel Spellfire wasn't money. It was a Mac. And they said, use this. You know, we need you, to, we need you not to type things and send them to us in, in huge, voluminous FedEx boxes. We need you to produce stuff electronically that we can just, you know, our secretarial pool doesn't have to retype. You know, which I also like, too, because the secretarial pool had a habit of coming across my mock medieval and invented words going, I don't know what he meant to say here, but let's turn it into modern American business English, you know, which. Yeah. <laughs> but so I, I've always worked on Macs. And one of the problem with working on, on Macs is at, at the beginning of things, there were few and far between, although they tended to be superb, 
um, except for the really simple ones. There were few and far between computer games meant to be played on Macs. They were usually meant to be played on the various Windows or, or before that, DOS computers, because that was the largest installed base of computers out there in the hands of people, so you could sell the most. So there were many, many games produced that I couldn't play technically on my computers. I couldn't load them. I couldn't play them. So as a result, I didn't get to play them very often. There's another thing. Although I was involved in a peripheral consulting way, you know, filtered through TSR all those years, in in a lot of the early games, the SSI games and so on, because I was still a source of the realms lore that they were using for the game, I always had problems with not having enough time. When you are the the sort of the, the go-to guy for a lot of people, and they're trying to develop the realms into this huge product line, then you're very busy if you're me. And of course, all that time, I had a full-time day job. And my day job for much, much of that time was 100 miles away from where I lived. So I was driving 200 miles a day and doing a full day job. And at the same time, trying to turn out umpty novels and, and lots of game products and help everybody else with their game products by answering their questions and providing sketches or maps here and, and heraldic designs or, or, or um, sketches of costumes and so on. So I was kept very busy. And one of the things that computer games do is eat time. One of the things I've never had enough of is time. So I've never had enough time to immerse myself in a computer game and just play it until I understand its every nuance and I've played through it with umpteen, you know, ways you can go in the game. One of the things that Jeff Grubb, who was, who was a, a friend of mine, um, introduced me to after he'd left the realms and was working on various computer games is the concept of, oh, go to this URL. We've got a level we haven't opened yet. It's not really populated, but you can walk around in it. So I would do that just, to, oh, okay, I would like to see what this is like because I, I don't get enough chance to play computer games. Now, the early computer games, I always thought were far too limiting, as in the computer didn't have the memory to do beautiful graphics and and smooth animation and at the same time handle all the incredibly creative judgment calls that a human being being a dungeon master could be. Some of the very early games that we played, as you know, were those text-based games where um, you were reduced to, oh, want to pick up gold, cannot pick up gold, must drop a lantern. Oh, drop lantern, pick up gold. Lantern drop, pick up gold. You, you, <laughs> no, you were, and you were going, oh, of course. You'll have those somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and although those are on one level fun for the first little while, you're thinking this is not Dungeons and Dragons. This is the most lowest level of dungeon crawl that I can think of. And I'm not being I, – I, I, can, I can do the, the, the dungeon call, the fighting monsters, and take their treasure, which is sort, sort of like the dungeon board game, but I can't do the intrigue and the acting and the so on. And as things went on, the, the games got better and better, and in particular, uh, as fans were able to write their own mods, you know, and, and – but I didn't – I never had time to really enjoy that. So my answer to that has to be on a – Rare occasions, I've been able to sit down at a convention or um, load a, a nice Realms game because one of the things that, that the TSR was very good at, Jim, Jim, Jim Ward in particular, he'd make sure I got copies of these games and I would download them and, or, or uh, um, install them on my computer and um, fumble finger my way through them and then start playing them. I never really got the chance to master them and, and enjoy the full experience. I must say what I see of computer games these days with the gorgeous art, the, 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 it, 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 we're finally approaching where, oh, I can lose myself in this wonderful world. And that's something that I haven't seen since the days of Myst and Riven and, you know, Cosmic Osmo and the Manhole, those, those, those games that you could just wander around and do things as opposed to fighting everybody. You know, you were trying to explore and play with things and puzzle things out. And, and I, I think that from what I've seen, and I'm not the guy to quote because I haven't seen enough, I think, that what, what 
gamers who game online or game with a with a console or game with their home computer get these days is breathtakingly good compared to what it was at the beginning just because of the advances of technology and the advances of what of computing power so what the games can be made to do and i am overjoyed to see all this creativity it's like yes there are all these people out here like you know like me fellow gamers who are improving this and improving that with each new game that comes out they get it they they know what i want so and we're we're still heading for that i mean i can remember playing castle wolfenstein as a first person shooter and i could wolfenstein 3d yeah, well well yeah. the, the, the initial little free one that came out and the yeah. pixels were so big and square you could literally not tell which way you were aiming and facing and and, and, <laughs> and but of course it's not that bad anymore you know <laughs> but the, the first one it was like what a cool idea oh my gosh i wish my eyes were better oh no it's not me it's the computer pixels darn how do we fix that and, and <laughs> you see what i mean <laughs> and and i'm still at that stage where i don't have time there's only one of me and i'm doing most years four novels and a couple major game design things and since kickstarter appeared on the horizon dozens of little things i'm always busy 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 and and i don't get the chance you know computer games what are computer games oh yeah solitaire <laughs> well if uh if you guys are ever looking for another writer lucas chris jansen who wrote neverwinter nights and baldur's gate one and two for bioware and obsidian uh, he'd be an excellent writer to write those, write a new novel for Forgotten Realms, because uh, he did a much better job with Baldur's Gate than I think Philip Athens did. Not that I blame Philip Athens, but Lucas Chris Jansen did a fantastic job writing those games in, in a world that used Drist and used Elminster and used, you know, Candlekeep and M and Baldur's Gate really, really, really well. It, it, that, that's the, those are the games that really got me paying attention to the realms, or at least not being paying attention, being able to see the big picture. Mm. Yeah. Now, one of the things I have never had, you know, a say in is, you know, who gets to do novels and so on. Um, I'm not a staff member at, at I wasn't at, I, at TSR and I haven't been at Wizards. So it's not up to me who gets a novel. The important thing to me is that a lot of voices get the chance to write fiction and design games in the realms, because I think it's stronger, the more variety. The, the, there is and 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 I, I say this because as, as you know from you know re reading online stuff there are people who hate this writer or their work and and who hate and love this writer over here and then there are people who same thing but they disagree they they hate the writer the other guy loves and they they love another writer the other guy hates and and I just think okay the realms is stronger if it isn't coming through one viewpoint, if it's lots of viewpoints. That's why I agreed initially to, to, to sell the realms so it became a shared world. If I hadn't, all you'd know of the Forgotten Realms, and it would probably be much smaller and known to far fewer people, would be me. There would be no Bob Salvatore Driss books because there would be no realms. You see what I mean? It's it's I, I yeah, I'm it, delighted it, it, by it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah I, all the people we've brought to the table. I, I was delighted to read Elaine Cunningham's Elf Song and then all of the books she wrote after that because when I I read Oh Elf Shadow was the first one, sorry. Elf Song yeah. was a sequel. And because I, I was reading through it and saying, This woman knows knows Waterdeep. This woman must have read my mind. This is real, this is Waterdeep come alive. She everything's right. And 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 there have been so many people since that have had a chance to crack at the realms, you know, to, to write a book. Um, Jerry Lee Johnson, um, Eric Scott to be. Um, Drew Carpishan. Yeah, all of the, there are, you know, I, I can go rattling off the, all the people in, in the Sundering, you know, the, and and it's for me, it's like, oh, a cornucopia, a buffet, a smorgasbord of great stuff where instead of the same writer always, which would be fine. Remember, that writer would be me. <laughs> and, 
and and I don't have enough time, remember? <laughs> so it, it's delightful that I can I can walk along this this beautiful buffet, going, oh yeah, I've always wanted to read a, a realm's romance. Boom, there it is. I've always wanted to read high comedy, slapstick comedy, low comedy in the realms, and I've wanted to read this really grim saga where the whole realms hangs in the balance. And one of the things I, I did a a series um, with a lot of other writers a few years ago, and I have to tell you the real work. Behind the scenes was done by Susan Morris, our, ed our editor on that, called Ed Greenwood Presents Waterdeep, which is a, a horribly grandiose um, um, title. Uh, but it, what it was is novels by all sorts of different writers, Stephen Shen writing Blackstaff Tower, kicking it off. And then we got to see all sorts of great writers. Rosemary Jones, wonderful City of the Dead. Um the Garen Evans started debuted with Godcatcher in that series, and it was like, wow, look at all these great novels I now get to read. I'm I'm so lucky, and they're all set in quote my world. Of course, it isn't my world anymore; it's our world. But to me, I'm just like a kid in a candy store. I'm leaping around gleefully, grabbing book after book and sitting down and reading them. And go, oh, this is great! My world come alive. So I mean, for me, it's it's the it's the variety of voices. I, which is why I I I I I love your recommendation, but I wouldn't want Phil to stop writing in the realms uh, right now. I th I think Phil is editing Bob's books, um, his novels. But I mean, but I mean, I would like everybody to come to the table and, and have a chance. I would like to the, the I would like the days back when there were twenty five realms novels a year, at least you know, crowding the shelves in the bookstores. And then everybody could say, well, I'm not in the mood for that one, but I'll pick up this one. Boy, no, I've never heard of this guy. Let's give, I like the cover. Let's give it a try. You know, that, that to me is the paradise where I want to be at. But on the other hand, Wizards of the Coast may quite rightly have other ideas because the one thing you never, ever, ever want to let happen is me to try and run things that involve money because I don't get it. I'm a creative guy. I'm not good at budgeting. I don't know what sells and what doesn't sell. I just love to create stuff in the realms that's my shtick i think that'll almost wrap up our realms talk just, just a couple more questions about about writing since a lot of our listeners are writers and so on and you come from exactly where they come from from writing with role playing with creating your own characters and you know fleshing out your own world what sort of tips or ideas you get from people who create their own characters create their own worlds and eventually want to make it more want to make it a novel want to publish it you know they could go to amazon or whatever they you know want to do for self-publishing but what are some tips you can give from personal experience to people who want to who have created something they think is really really good with their their characters with role playing with their own creations and want to make it into something that everyone else can enjoy too okay let oh let me begin by saying take everything i say with a pinch of salt because we're all different as writers okay. what works for me may not work for you but in general, I can say, particularly for people who, whose writing grows out of role playing or out of gaming, okay, tell me a story. I don't, because, because I, you know, I, I love fantasy. I love science fiction. I love mystery. I love horror. I, I love pulp adventure. I've written a lot of it and I've read a lot of it. Recommendation number one read, 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 read widely. Not just in the genre you like, but make sure you read all sorts of things because you could see how writers handle things, how they handle the pacing in a book, how they emphasize something, how they put in something else that's a clue in a mystery or that will come up later, but they don't emphasize it. So you may not notice it. So they don't, aren't telegraphing it, how they describe characters, how they work in descriptions without stopping the flow of the narrative for an info dump, all that stuff that is the craft of writing you pick up. By reading writers, good and bad, stuff that you like, that you know is bad for you, like, you know, tons and tons of chocolate bars. Um, but, I mean, writers like that, that you don't think are very good. But because sometimes if you just concentrate on the writers that awe you and you think, oh, this is so great, you're just, it, it freezes you in place. You could say, I could never do that. Oh, my goodness, where do I start? So you, you want to try everybody. Because you want to see what works and doesn't work, what works for you, what what the 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 the, the storytelling tricks, the narrative, the style, 
what is presented to you in terms of um, background information and lore that you need to know to understand the stakes in this story, um, how is it fed to you without stopping the action? How is it slipped in? So there's all that craft stuff. But most importantly, and I, I've seen this over and over again with gamers, because, you know, I go to a lot of conventions. I, I do a lot of panels on writing, and people rush up to me. They're all excited. They say, I, you know, I've been working on this world for years, and it's got flying castles, and it's got this, and it's got that. And I say, yeah, 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 yeah. Guess what? I've been reading fantasy for years. In many cases, longer than you've been alive. I've seen lots of fantastic worlds. I get that you have this vividly realized fantasy world that you've been working on. I respect that because you're doing one of the most, well, for want of a better word, sacred creative things that, that you, can, you can spend your time on. But none of that matters when I'm opening a book. What I want when I open a book is I want you to tell me a story. In the same way that you were captivated by at your mother's knee or your grandfather beside the fire or, or at camp, around a campfire, I need a cracking good yarn set in your great world. I don't need to be to told everything about the world. Guess what? I trust you. I honor you. I respect you. And what those three words mean is I get it that you've probably worked out the entire ruling dynasty of this kingdom back to its founding. I get that. I expect you've already done that. You don't have to tell me the entire ruling dynasty unless it is integral to your story. Tell me a good story first. That's what will want me to come back for more. I'll say, oh, that guy or that gal, I, the last book by them I read, which was the only book by them I read because it was your first book, um, really grabbed me. I want to read more. And the other thing is, people remember bad plots and incoherent plots, but they don't necessarily remember good plotting other than the story unfolded the, sort of the way it should. But they remember good, vivid characters. If you can bring the character to life, they'll say, oh, I want to I know what happens next to that character because that character has become my friend or my companion or the person I laugh at or the person I love to hate if they're a villain. But I want, I want more about that character. So people remember good, vividly realized characters. But, again, the old basic rule of writing, show, don't tell. So don't tell me the character is a dastardly villain. Show me the character being a dastardly villain. In other words, show me the characters in action. So tell me a story. It's not about the, the stuff I've done for, for almost five decades, um, accumulating lore about your world. One of the reasons so much lore has been accumulated is because there are so many other creative people at work in the realms. Just as my players demanded all this information, they wanted to know where their characters came from, what their characters had by the way of day jobs before they went adventuring, what the political pressures were, what was happening in the, in the world. Was it feast or famine time? Was there a good crop in this? And in the same way that all of these creative people needed to know stuff, so I had to create it. So I went on creating detail after detail after detail. For you, when you're writing a story, this could be procrastination time sink time. You could spend year after year of your life detailing the world and planning your story and never getting around to writing your story. Write it. Write the whole story. Because it's much easier to fix or polish or improve something you've written than to stare at a blank computer screen. Well, it stares back at you. Guess what? The computer knows that you're going to blink first. So you got to fill that white space on the computer screen and save every five minutes. You know, make sure that you save. So, you, you know, when, when the... Uh, Lightning strike hits and your computer goes dead. You haven't lost your masterpiece. Keep on saving, but write the story first and then rewrite it. Um, go through it, set it aside, and write something else, something different to, as a refresher. Write about different characters. Then pull the, pull the file back out that you haven't looked at for a couple of weeks or a couple months. Reread it and say, ooh, that, that, that's awkward or Oh, the story's somehow pretty flat here. I, I, I got bored by my own writing here. What did I do wrong? And then fix the story. But it's all about giving me a good, satisfying yarn. And as you can probably tell, I can blather about this all night long. <laughs>
I think that'll be for a, 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 another podcast. We're quite sure we'd like to have you on again in the future just to talk about writing. My goodness, that was amazing. And I, I don't think there's a better place to, to wrap this up since we said an hour and it, we just hit an hour. So uh, The Herald comes out on Tuesday. Uh, is there any um, any appearances or anything you'd like to promote at this time so fans can find you or maybe get signed copies of the book and so on? Uh, we'll give you the soapbox to promote well, promote your book. Well, <laughs> okay. Um, yes, The Herald should be available at better bookstores everywhere, as they say. But if you want a signed copy, and for that matter, with a customized inscription, um wander to my website, which is theedverse.com. Not just edverse.com, because that's a, that's a website for, for learning online. Theedverse, all one word, theedverse.com. Because there, as well as free stuff and me blogging about, you know, whatever interests me, which tends to be about writing, um, there you can also, on the banner across the top of the page, you can order signed copies of the Herald, and I will sign them and write it whatever inscription you want so you, you can give it as a gift to someone or um you could you can uh, uh commemorate your character your favorite character i will write the inscription you want i will bung it in the mail myself to you so that's one place you can get signed copies of the herald you can probably also run into me at conventions uh gen con as every year i will probably be um unless something goes wrong i will be at Grand Con in September in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I will be at Game Hole in Madison, Wisconsin in November. And if you run into me there, don't expect me to have big piles of the Herald under my arm. But if you bring your own copy that you've already bought or can find one for sale at the con, I will happily inscribe it and sign it whatever you want. <laughs> because for me, it's all about getting to meet my readers talking about the realms, having fun together, enjoying fantasy together. Thank you so much, sir, and we'd love to have you on again in the future. We'll we'll set it up in the future. Um, okay. Because okay. I know our listeners are going to want to hear more about writing, more about creating things. Now that they've heard, you know, heard, heard a lot of your stories and so on, I'm quite sure the next time around they'll have a lot more fan questions because this has been fantastic. This has been an honor, sir. I've read your stuff since I was a kid. And this is this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Thank you. And uh, best of luck with your release on Tuesday. Thank you. Should be. It's, I've read it, so it's a, it's a great way to end the series. So. <laughs> so you know I'm about gonna, all that fun stuff we did. We we did. Yeah. Spoilers. We did it, that's always been the hardest part with these interviews. Since I've read the books before, I've done all the interviews. It's really hard not to spoil it. I think since I knew Kemp beforehand. After we just turned off the recorder and just talked about his book for like an hour, and then he realized he needed to drive home. Yes. But it, it, it's it, it's always fantastic, and I, I've loved this series. It's got me really not just inspired to read, you know, more of the realms, but also, as you mentioned, you know, reading lots of different authors with different styles. Like you and Bob, you know, have more of a conventional classic fantasy style, and you have Kemp and uh, Danny, which went way darker than most people do, mm -hmm. especially Kemp. Then you have the more of the you know the adventure action um, style with uh, with buyers, and then you have Erin, which gave her well she had a, the only female lead in the series, and that was fantastic on its own, and you know gave her own unique more more emotional side of of these books, and it was great to see how different authors approach different things. And of course, I have my favorites, and the one like I, I, I have to say, Kemp's novel was probably my favorite in the series. It was it was deliciously dark, and I. I it made me want to read every book he's ever done. It was, and and uh, I I I kept thinking, ah, am I going to be killing off some of these guys? Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, now, have you read his Eagle and Nick's books from Random? House? Not yet. Okay. Uh, I haven't ordered, but I need to. Uh, they're I fun. And and Aaron's next sure book we can mention, um, Fire in the Blood, because Amazon has posted its stuff yet already, and I know she finished it. Uh, she's finished it and handed it in. It may not be finished editing, but but so there will be another Farida book after The Adversary that isn't part of The Sundering called Fire. And we just got more Drist books as well. Yes. Oh, well. Okay. I have to tell you, during our summit, our last summit, Bob sat down and for 10 minutes told us the next Drist books. He has them in his mind already. He told us that he, The Companions was originally intended to be his final Drist book and he was going to walk away from Drist. Yeah. gotten so excited he had some more to go. Yeah. You see what he what he did back, back when they, they did the time jump. He actually said, you guys are making a mistake. And when all you guys are fired, 
I'm going to have to bring back these characters who otherwise would die because of old age, because of the time jump. So he put them, as you know, with Regis and so on, he put them in places from which he could retrieve them to reform the companions. And then he did that. And initially it was going to be, okay, I'm reforming the companions to show you guys, and then I'm out of here. But of course, once he started in the new series, he said, oh, this is wonderful. Yes, let's do this. So, yeah, he then sat down and in his mind said, okay, this is what would happen. And this is what would happen with Drist. This is what what would happen with Dahlia. This is what, you know, and he worked it all out. Uh, put it this way. Because Bob is doing two books a year, he's way ahead of what you've seen so far. How, that's the best way to put it. So, yeah, you've got Drist books coming for now into the foreseeable future. And more Elminster, I take it, too. Uh, well, at least one more, because I'm hard at work on it right now. It has to be in by 1st of July. And well, I, I can't tell you anything else about it, because the title could still change, although I don't think it will. And, yeah, I, I, okay, guess what? It's got Elminster in it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I think we're going to leave it okay. at that, sir. Thank you so much. We'll definitely want to have you on again in the future, and I hope we can set that up. Uh, we'll give it. A, we'll give it a, a few. Minutes. Sure, <laughs> that'd be great. Thank you so much, sir. This is an honor, and good luck finishing your novel. Uh, I can't wait to read it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jeremiah. Bye. This was great. Bye, sir. Okay. Have a have a great day. You too. Bye. Thank you.